Great to see you today. Thanks for being here. Hope you're having a great weekend. Have you ever asked the question, why does God allow suffering? Now, you may say, well, that's never crossed my mind. But for most people in this room, for most listening to me today, you have asked the question at some point in your life, why? Why does God allow suffering? Now, you may say, well, I'm really not worried about it because I'm trusting God. I'm, I'm, I, know, I don't understand everything, but God's been good to me, so I'm just trusting Him. But you're scared to death that some skeptic is going to ask you one day and you don't have an answer. So in any case, most of us, for whatever reason, have at some point asked the question, why does God allow suffering? Maybe you've heard of Philip Yancey's uh, Christian author. He sold 15 million books. Somebody's reading his books. When Philip Yancey was not even a year old, his father, who was planning to go to the mission field, was diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, and he was put on life support. And he had some well-meaning Christian friends who believed that he was going to be healed. And with Philip Yancey's father's consent, they believed that if they removed life support, it would be an act of faith and he would be healed. But he died. And so Philip Yancey grew up without a father. And that impacted him. And he missed having a father throughout his life. And he came to understand what suffering is like from that perspective at a very early age. Later on, he became a secular journalist. And he was sent to some of the most terrible places in the world and in some of the most difficult circumstances in order to cover them for the news media. And he saw suffering on a scale that was unimaginable. So at the age of 27, this young Christian wrote a book called Where is God When It Hurts? And it sold like crazy. Well, fast forward many years. A few years back, the publishers of that book and this is 25 or 30 years or more after the book was originally written, the publishers decided that they were going to release some free downloads of the book off Facebook. Now, keep in mind, they had made their money many times over because this book had sold wildly beyond anybody's expectations 30-plus years ago. So a few years ago, the publishers decided, we'll give the book away as a free download off Facebook. They were expecting a few hundred people, maybe a thousand people, would download this old book, Where is God When It Hurts? To their surprise, 100,000 people downloaded the book, which demonstrates this. People are asking a question. And the question, no matter how you frame the question, is why? Why does God allow suffering? Why is there pain and suffering in the world? And we know there is suffering in the world. We know that the Christian faith is based upon the suffering of Jesus. We know that godly people suffer. Paul suffered. Godly people around the world today are suffering. I just read about Another major church in Beijing shut down by the communist Chinese. The crackdown on Christianity in China is as bad now as since the days of Mao. And maybe worse. And we know that godly people are suffering around the world. And you have godly friends that you know that are suffering right now. And perhaps you're suffering right now. So we know that godly people suffer. And the question is, why? Well, this is not a new question. 
In fact, the second century Greek philosopher Epicurus posed this dilemma 2,200 years ago when he said, if God is not able to stop suffering, then he is not all-powerful. And if, if he is not willing to stop suffering or to end suffering, then he's not all good. And you see the dilemma. Well, you and I know that God is all-powerful, and we know that He is holy, and He is the standard and definition of good. So if God is all-powerful, and if God is good, and we know that He is, why do people suffer? Well, we're going to wade into that question this morning as we look at the subject, How Believers Accept Suffering, Part 2. And uh, we're going to begin reading in chapter 1 of Colossians. We started this last week. Last week we covered six words. We're going to get a little further today. But last week we looked at verse 24, and we only looked at the first part of the first sentence. Now I rejoice in my sufferings. That's what we looked at last week. But look at verse 24 again. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Now how many of you know that if you know that there is a reason for suffering, it makes the suffering a little less unbearable. It makes it a little more bearable if you have some idea why it's happening. Well, last week we looked at the fact that we rejoice in our suffering. And uh, I'm just going to recap real quick last week. I don't want to spend too much time on it. I just encourage you to go back to our website and look it up. But We looked last week at the point, and just recapping quickly, that believers can accept suffering with rejoicing. Believers can accept suffering with rejoicing. Because look at verse 24. We looked at these six words last week. Now I rejoice in my sufferings. And last week we looked at four ways that we rejoice in suffering. Let me just recap them for you. Number one, we rejoice in suffering consistently. Because Paul said, I rejoice. I am rejoicing. That's a present tense verb. It means that it's not just something that Paul worked up on an occasion. It's not just that he had some, you know, moments when he would allow himself the privilege of rejoicing. He rejoiced as a way of life. In other words, for Christians, joy is a lifestyle. It is something we do all the time. It means that We rejoice when we suffer. We rejoice when we have good things or bad things. Circumstances never dictate our joy. We rejoice consistently. Number two, we rejoice in suffering, not because of it. We rejoice in suffering, not because of it. In other words, when Paul said, I rejoice in suffering, he didn't say, I rejoice because of suffering. He didn't say, I rejoice uh, when bad things happen. He said, I'm rejoicing in spite of bad things. So in other words, if somebody gets a phone call and says, hey, you got to go through six weeks of chemo, you don't say, oh man, this is wonderful that I've got cancer. Or if your wife walks out and takes your kids with you, you don't say, oh, this is so wonderful. Or uh, Or if one day you wake up and you're going into bankruptcy, you say, oh, I didn't need that money after all. He said, I rejoice in my suffering, not because of it. Number three, he said, we rejoice in suffering because it can strengthen your faith. And this is something that is taught real strong in James. Because in James chapter 1, we see in verse 2, he said, count it all joy, my brothers, When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. In other words, it seems counterintuitive to say that sometimes suffering can actually benefit you. That sometimes suffering, as uncomfortable as is, uh, as, uh, you know, discomforting as it can be, in the long run it's better. 
like an athlete training for the championship. He has to run a lot of laps. He's got to lift a lot of weights. He's got to swim a lot of laps. Or he's got to do a lot of push-ups. Or he has to discipline his diet. None of those things are particularly enjoyable. But if you want to win the championship, you've got to spend a lot of hours in the gym. So the strain and the struggle is sometimes the only thing that gets you to the championship. And Paul is using that kind of idea and James is using that kind of idea, and all throughout the Bible it is taught that joy is actually a response because suffering is a benefit to us because it prepares us for things that are coming later, and it strengthens us for things that haven't happened yet. And number four, you rejoice because it's a choice. Paul said, now I rejoice in my suffering. Now, in other words, it's a declarative statement. Now I am rejoicing. Regardless of circumstances, I choose to rejoice. You're either going to get bitter or better as a result of suffering. And that leads me into today's truth. I want us to notice this morning, that was a recap of last week. This morning I want us to notice this. Believers can accept suffering for a reason. For a reason. In other words, aren't you glad that the Bible does not call us to suffering and gives us no explanation for it? You know, sometimes people in your world may think that you have blind faith. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Christianity is not blind faith. Christianity is faith in facts and faith in evidence. You say, well, what evidence? Well, I'll give you one good evidence, an empty tomb. That's not just a matter of faith. That's a matter of fact. And so when we have when we're approached with the reality of suffering and we have to deal with the reality of suffering, we're not just asked to just, just close your eyes and enjoy it. No. God actually gives us some reasons for suffering. And Paul explains that in verse 24. Look at it. He said, Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Some of you may have heard of Viktor Frankl. He was a Jewish neurosurgeon and psychiatrist living in Austria. And when Hitler's army swept through Austria and uh, put the Jews in concentration camps, Viktor Frankl, this brilliant neurosurgeon and psychiatrist, was put into the concentration camps. In fact, he, bounced, he was bounced during the war, he was bounced to six concentration camps. Can you imagine that? And he saw suffering as a prisoner of the Nazi concentration camp. He saw suffering on a level that most of us could not fathom. And he saw that some people just died as a result of their lack of purpose and the suffering that killed some, others lived through. And he came to the realization that if people had a sense of hope, if they had a sense of believing there was some reason for this, that they could make it. But if they gave up, if they gave in, they didn't have a chance. And he made this incredible statement, and I want to show it to you. He said, despair is suffering without meaning. Let me just Pause on that for a moment. Despair, he said, is suffering without meaning. In other words, if you are going through a period of suffering in your life and you see no reason for it and you have no way to understand there's a cause for it or that there's some hope for something better coming out of it, the inevitability for most people is despair. And despair, he said, is suffering without meaning. Everything, he said, can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude at any, in any given set. 
of circumstances. Well, Paul here in verse 24 is saying to the Colossians, look, suffering has a purpose. It, has a, it plays a role. It serves a purpose. And there are reasons for suffering. Now, uh, before I get into verse 24, let me, let, me make a, let me make a disclaimer, all right? Verse 24 does not answer everything about suffering, right? How many of you have read enough Scripture, walked with God enough to know that everything is not explained by one verse? And so, if you are, uh, if you are comfortable in the fact that you don't really have to have an explanation because God's been good to you, you love the Lord, and you're willing to serve Him no matter what. You're comfortable with all that, but you're scared to death some skeptic in your office is going to ask you why you believe in God since God allows suffering, and you really don't know what to say. Let me give you some thoughts, okay? These are generally true and taught in Scripture. You ready? Number one, we live in a fallen world as a result of sin. Let me say it a different way. And I don't want to be overly simplistic on this, but I want you to think about it. Some suffering is a direct result of sin. In other words, you've done something back there and you're paying the price for it now. That is the whole message of the story of the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve made a bad choice, and bad choices lead to bad consequences. You believe that? Now, that's not the explanation for all suffering, and I'm going to get into some other reasons why people suffer. And, uh, but that's the reason for some suffering. I make choices, and then I pay a price for the choices that I've made. So bad decisions lead to painful consequences. Let me ask you a different way. Have you ever heard the old expression, I'm my own worst enemy? Do you, have you ever looked at something in your life and you're not enjoying it, you're going through some painful circumstance, and you can go back to the decisions that you made earlier that led you to this painful consequence. I mean, think about health. Let's use, get out of the area of faith and morality and just look at health. Here's a person, they start smoking, and they just smoke, 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 year, year, decade after decade, and then one day the doctor says, you have lung cancer. And they say, what? How did this happen? Nobody told me. Well, what about that big warning label on the package that says, warning, you're going to die from this? Oh, gee, I wish I'd have taken that seriously. Or what about the person who spends a lifetime eating wrong, bad diet, and then one day they find out high cholesterol, heart disease, and they go, how did this happen? Well, <laughs> you've been working on this for a while now. didn't just happen overnight. I don't get any amens on this. <laughs> or what about uh, uh, excessive drinking? person drinks, 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 life of the party, then all of a sudden, liver disease. But it's not all of a sudden. You, you, you earned this. You worked for it. You say, well, you sound critical and judgmental. What's wrong with us? Why can't we look at the facts? This isn't judgmentalism. This is science. I'm not being judgmental. I'm just laying it out here. If you eat terrible, you're going to suffer. If you excessively drink over a long period of time, you're going to suffer. What, you say, I don't want to hear any more about this. Well, let's talk finances for a minute. Oh, you don't like that either person gets out of college, and they get their first real good job, and then let's say they're making us, I don't know, let me make up $50,000 a year. They're going to make $50,000 a year. So what do they do? They get credit cards, and they start living large, because after all, you got income. 
And then a couple years into it, you realize you got $60,000 worth of credit card bills and you make $50,000 a year. It took you two years to earn the credit card bills and 25 years to pay off the debt. What happened? Bad choices equals painful consequences. You say, I don't like talking about this. Well, let's talk about the law for a minute. Here's a guy who likes... <laughs> I don't mean anybody in particular now. Here's a guy who likes to drive fast, enjoy, enjoy speed, but does not enjoy flashing lights in his rearview mirror. Bad choices bring painful consequences. Well, we know this is true in every area of life, that every choice you have, every choice you make has consequences. And if you make bad choices, they inevitably lead to painful consequences. You say, well, that doesn't explain all, that doesn't explain all suffering. True. Let me give another reason for not only is sin, you know, bad choices, a reason for suffering, but how many of you know, come on, there are some bad people in the world. And some suffering is a direct result of evil people. I mean, if you could wave a magic wand and take evil people out of the world, look how many people would benefit if everybody that was leading them was just good. And don't talk to me about American politics when I'm talking about evil people, I'm talking about tyrannies where people, because they love the Lord, are put in prison camps. All over the world, people are suffering today because of terrible leadership. And if evil people are given the freedom to do so, they can wreck your life. And then there's another reason for suffering. Not only sin, not only the bad people in the world. Here's the worst kind. And I'll tell you why it's the worst kind. Because you don't have an answer for it. It's the suffering with no apparent reason. That's the kind of suffering that gives us the most struggle. Because we don't know how to explain it. All we can do is just trust in some unseen plan of God. Because we can't explain it. There, there, there's no direct link to some sin. There's no evil person causing it. We just say, I don't know. You say, well, give me an example. Have you ever walked through a children's hospital? There are some things in this world that we just have to acknowledge that whether you're a Christian or an atheist, you have no answer. There are some things in this world where suffering does not have a direct cause and effect that we're aware of. Well, let me give you another reason. Verse 24. Paul here gives us another reason for suffering. Look at verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. So one of the reasons for suffering is to help others spiritually. You say, what? Paul was in prison when he wrote verse 24. He was talking about his own suffering. He was using himself as an example. And I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Paul rarely talked about himself. Now, I can show you many cases where he did, but it's not the norm. Paul usually did not insert his own situation into the conversation, but in this case he did. And he said, I want you to look at my circumstance and my situation as an example. And I want to use what is happening in my life as a way of encouraging your spiritual growth. He said, I rejoice in my sufferings which are for your sake. I want you to look up here at the little word for. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And then read on a little further. And in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. The word for there is the operative word because the word for means on behalf of. It's the same exact word in the Greek New Testament that Paul used in the book of Romans when he said Christ died for us. In other words, he died in our place. He died on our behalf. 
for here means on behalf of or in the place of. And so Paul said one of the reasons for suffering is when you choose to suffer for the sake of somebody else's spiritual growth. You say, that's bizarre. Well, that's what Paul said he was doing. You see, he didn't even know the Colossians. And he said, I am suffering for your sake. And uh, there's something else that he says here that for, if you are familiar with the New Testament at all, is going to drive you slightly crazy until you get some resolution on it. Because look what he said. I'm suffering for your sake, and I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now, how many of you that just strikes you odd? I mean, come on. Because your first thought, if you're like most people, your first thought is, hold on a minute. Whoa. whoa. Lacking in Christ's afflictions? Now, now, Paul, let me get this straight. Now, how many of you know I'm teaching now? So stay with me. How many of you would look at that passage and you think, surely he's not saying that when Jesus died on the cross for my sins, it wasn't enough. But I mean, look what the Bible says. I, through my suffering, am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. And you say, wait a minute, this is a head scratcher. Are you telling me That when I turned to Christ in Fairbanks, Alaska as a teenager and asked Jesus to take away my sins, His death on the cross was insufficient to cover my sins. And Paul, spending a couple of years in a Roman prison, filled in the gaps. Are you kidding me? Well, that's not what he's saying. And we know it's not what he's saying. Paul would never say that he spending a prison term was sufficient to cover your sins. So what is he saying? Well, first of all, we got to go back to his testimony. Are you all still with me? How many of you came to church just to get a Hallmark card? Just somebody tell you Jesus loves you, nothing else, go home. Some of you did. You're going to get more than that here. We're going to teach the Word of God. And in order to do that, we've got to slow down and walk through some complex passages, and this is one of them. So Paul says, I'm filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions. Well, in what way? Well, first of all, the word affliction means outside pressure. It means like a vice. How many of you guys know what a vice is? You put something in a vice... And it puts pressure from both sides and holds the thing tightly in place. Well, this word affliction literally means pressure like a vice. It is a word which is never used in the New Testament even one time to describe the suffering of Jesus on the cross. Not once is this word used to describe Christ's death on the cross. So therefore, when Paul said... Christ's afflictions, he is not talking about the death of Jesus on the cross. That's our first thought. We first think of Christ's suffering, we think of his death on the cross. Paul is not referring to Christ's death on the cross in this passage. You say, then what suffering are we talking about? Go to Paul's testimony. In Acts 9, verse 4, He's going to Damascus, Syria to arrest Christians, bring them to trial, and hopefully have them executed for their faith in Christ. Remember? And what happened? Jesus, the resurrected Savior, appeared to him. How many of you remember the story? Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, was Saul intentionally persecuting Jesus? No, as far as Saul of Tarsus was concerned, now look, I'm not being blasphemous, I'm telling you the facts. As far as Saul was concerned, Jesus 
was rotting somewhere. He believed that Jesus was crucified and buried and that his body had been stolen and that his corpse was decomposing somewhere and nobody knew where because he didn't believe in the resurrection. And then all of a sudden on the road to Damascus, Syria, here's Jesus appearing to him. He said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But Saul wasn't going to Damascus, Syria to persecute Jesus of Nazareth. He believed Jesus of Nazareth was dead and in his grave. He was going to persecute Christians. He was going to persecute the church. And Jesus said, Saul, when you persecute my people, I take it personally. I feel it. So there is an affliction against Jesus post-resurrection. And Jesus spoke to that when he said in Acts uh, 9, verses 4 and 5, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. Twice he used this word for persecution. It's not the same word as affliction, but the idea here is this, that when Paul talks about the afflictions of Jesus and that he's filling up what's lacking in the afflictions of Jesus, he came to understand in his very first encounter with Jesus that our Lord Jesus Christ is not indifferent to your suffering. Amen, pastor, preach the word. (laughs) Jesus is not indifferent to your suffering, child of God. When you go through the difficulties and the problems and the challenges, our resurrected Lord feels that in the same way that you feel a pain in one part of your body and your whole body is aware of it. And Paul came to understand that as the very first thing that he learned about the Lord Jesus. Is that the Lord Jesus feels the pain that his people feel. And Paul said, for that reason, I am willing to set you an example, church. I am willing to show you that I am willing to suffer the things that are causing you to suffer. I am willing to take the heat on your behalf. Remember... The Colossian church was a little church in the middle of nowhere in Turkey. The Roman uh, persecution had not reached them yet, but Paul could see that it was coming, and he was willing to set them an example. And he was basically saying, look, you watch how I do this, because eventually it'll be on your doorstep, and I want you to remember how I go through suffering to set you an example. So I am willing to go through this on your behalf. I am suffering, he said in verse 24, for your sake. You say, well, that's just too much. I mean, that, he's a super apostle. Who would do that? Nobody would suffer for the sake of another person. Really? Let me ask you a question. How many moms do we have in the room? Could I see your hand? How many moms in this room have actually given birth? Let me see your hand. All right, moms, on a scale to 1 to 10, how pleasant is childbirth, actually? Hmm? (laughs) Twelve, she said. (laughs) I was there when all my kids were born, and here's what I would say, and every gentleman in the room is going to agree with this. If dads had babies instead of moms, the human race ends here and now. Forget Russia and China. (laughs) There's no human race after this if dads have to deliver babies. But moms deliver babies. And how many of you know there are more than 7 billion people on this planet? What does that tell you? There's a lot of moms. And a lot of moms have more than one. So what 
keeps mom going back to the valley of the shadow of death. (laughs) The answer is real simple. They love their children. And the love they have for their children is worth the pain of childbirth. Moms, could I get an amen? Dads, could I get an amen? Paul here is saying in the same way that there are human examples of why some people are willing to suffer on behalf of others because of their great love for them, Paul is saying, I love you and I am willing to suffer on your behalf. But let me show you something else and I'm going to hurry. Not only, he said, am I willing to take the heat for the sake of the the afflictions that Christ's people are suffering. But look what he said, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. That is the church. So not only does Paul say, I'm willing to suffer for the sake of somebody else's spiritual health and spiritual growth, I am willing to suffer to bless the church. To bless the church. And I want you to look exactly at what Paul said. Because look, he had never met the Colossians. He didn't know them personally. He wouldn't recognize them in a lineup. So why was he willing to suffer so much for these people he had never met? Well, look carefully what the Bible says. He said, I'm willing to do this for the sake of his body. Remember, his first encounter with Jesus, he came to the realization and the awareness that when any part of the body of Christ suffers, our Lord feels it. He's aware of it. And Paul came to the understanding, maybe more deeply than most of us have ever quite comprehended, that we are actually the body of Christ. And so when Paul said, I'm willing to suffer for your sake. He said, for the sake of his body. And if somebody says, well, man, check this out. The apostle Paul is willing to suffer for me. Paul said, you know what? I am suffering for you, but don't get the big head. I'm really suffering for his body. My real motivation, is anybody with me? My real incentive here is after what he's done for me, I'm willing to do anything for him. And when I have to pay the price for my preaching and my teaching, verse 25, he says, this is all because of the word of God. He said, I am willing to endure all this for one reason. I love him so much. I owe him so much. And if I have to suffer temporarily after what he has done to give me eternal life it is worth it and if you benefit as a result of it so be it about 25 years ago I was invited to go preach a youth camp over in Arkansas and uh, my friend Ronnie Floyd was there because he pastored a church about 20 minutes from there and when he walked in he was going to speak to the teenagers that I was preaching to in the morning and the night, and he was doing like an afternoon session. When he walked in, he was bone thin. I thought, what in the world is going on? And then he gave his testimony that he had just completed a 40-day fast. Well, I'd never heard of anything like this in my life. I'd never heard of anybody except Moses, Elijah, and Jesus doing a 40-day fast. I didn't know people did that. And so when I got back to my church in Georgia, after being in Arkansas, I called my buddy John. And I said, John, I just saw Ronnie, and he just did a 40-day fast. And my buddy John is like, what? And I'm like, yeah, he read a book by Bill Bright, and Bill Bright had just done a 40-day fast, and he felt God was calling him to do a 40-day fast. And my buddy John said, that is wild. About three weeks later, my buddy John called me up and he said, hey man, I'm in day 17 of my 40-day fast. And I'm like, what? And he goes, i got news for you, Kai. God is calling you to a 40-day fast. And I'm like, brother, you have missed God big time on this one. 
you are way off the track spiritually on this. But my buddy did that 40-day fast, and sure enough, by the end of that year, at the age of 39, I did a 40-day fast. I didn't eat one crumb. I didn't eat one bite of food for 40 days. No soup, no nothing. 40 days, no food. That's like the equivalent of like going Thanksgiving to New Year's. Not that time of year, but that time frame. And you say, well, that's awesome, man. Really? Well, try going one day without food and tell me how awesome it is. There's some suffering involved. You go 40 days without food, your body aches, your, your bones hurt. After a few weeks of not eating, your feet hurt. Your bones, everything about you is like, your friends are like, are you crazy? What's wrong? Your wife is like, what is up with you? I know for a fact that my whole life changed as a result of that decision. And the Lord led me here and gave me what I needed to stay here. Because God had prepared me through that 40-day fast. But I did that 40-day fast because I saw the obedience of my buddy John, who heard my testimony about our friend Ronnie, who had been influenced by a guy we didn't know, Bill Bright, who started Campus Crusade. And here's what I'm saying to you. When Bill Bright did that 40-day fast, I never crossed his mind. When my buddy Ronnie did that 40-day fast, I promise you not one time did he think, this is for Kai. When my buddy John did the 40-day fast, he wasn't thinking, I'm fighting through all this for Kai's sake. Every one of those men said, I am doing this for one reason. I am doing it, O oh Lord, for you. I love you, Lord, and I'm going to pay this price in order to know you more and enjoy the fellowship of your suffering, and I might know the resurrection power. And as a result, I was blessed through their obedience, and I was called to follow in their obedience by the Lord himself. And as my obedience played out, I can't tell you the number of people who decided that after they had seen what I went through, they too were being called to a 40-day fast, even members of, this own, of our own church right here. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying that whatever you may suffer for the cause of Christ will never be wasted that God will never allow what you're going through to not be a blessing to his body if you are willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. Everybody jump up on your feet.